Kemp's former housemate, Millie Mason, and Auckland City Detective Inspector Scott Beard. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, Scott, let's start off with you, first of all, if you don't mind. So when you first heard about Grace's disappearance, what, what were you thinking then? Because you said it's not uncommon for backpackers to sort of go missing maybe for a few days. Maybe they've lost signal on their phone. Maybe they're on one of the islands. What were you thinking? Morning, Holly. Look, it was only the fact that it came to the criminal investigation branch right at the start. There were these red flags, and you immediately think you hope for all hope that you're going to find her, but the red flags would indicate that it could be a lot more serious. So you take it seriously from the start. So I had to ensure that the staff that afternoon, it was Wednesday, the 5th of December, were um, you know, focused on working out who Grace was. We have to know who our victim is. Um, and, of course, the UK time is in the middle of the night, middle of our day there. So, and also, where was she staying? Who was she friends with? The social media, Facebook. And so a lot of inquiries were done on that Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night. And then on the Thursday morning, the 6th, we brought a team together to start the investigation. Because in the city, CCTV is everywhere. And it's a huge phase we have to have. Um, you know, and what happened on the Wednesday afternoon is on Grace's Facebook page, yeah. the last person to comment was a person by the name of Jesse Shane. Now, we didn't know who that person was at the time. The message was sent. The next day, the next morning, he contacts us, arranges an interview to come into the police station to be interviewed on the Thursday afternoon. By that stage, we'd obviously done a lot more background work into who Grace was, um, family, and where she'd been staying at the backpackers, and, of course, for the CCTV. And that's because he'd said uh, that he left her at 8pm. Uh, it was the CCTV that proved that uh, he, he, he was lying. Uh, and that re really flagged him up to you guys. Um, at, at what point did you realise what he'd done? I think it's not until we had the search warrant and we'd gone to his apartment and the forensic scientists overnight had sprayed luminol, which is a agent which reacts with blood and in the dark will make the blood glow. And then when you see his room and you see the blood in his room and you just go, oh, my gosh, you know. And we knew by that stage that he was lying because we caught him out lying during his first interview on the Thursday night. I mean, um, but we didn't have sufficient to charge at that stage. Yeah. The, uh, the, unbeknown to anyone, um, I mean, you were then to find out that um, he'd strangled Grace to death on the night of the 1st of December. Next day, he bought a suitcase. There was CCTV footage of that. Put Grace's body in it, hired a car, drove 12 miles west of Auckland to the Waitakere's, um, buried the suitcase, and then went back to the room, bought an array of cleaning supplies to, to clean the crime scene. He, um, he, he always said that it was this rough sex. At no point did he ever admit to, to murder. No, not even during the trial. He never admitted to the murder. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that rough sex, putting the blame back on the victim, and she can't answer. Grace is dead. Um, he, never, he chose not to give evidence, and that's his right. But, yeah, it was, it was pretty tough because, you know, she can't answer. And, of course, we knew he's a liar. He just, everything he's telling us, even his second interview on the Saturday afternoon, there's a number of lies in there. Um, thank you. Well, let's speak to Millie now, because, Millie, you, were, you lived with this man, this man that we are talking about here, this murderer. Um, the reason why you met him in the first place was because you were living with a group of girls and you were looking for a fourth flatmate. Yes. So you'd advertised this position. One of your yeah. flatmates had spoken to him on the phone and he had quite, quite the story about who he was. Yeah. Oh, it was elaborate. He was coming over to New Zealand. He'd lived in Australia to buy... French, or buy bars to add to the franchise his father owned. Mm -hmm. That was his story. Yeah. And so this all sort of started to unravel because obviously he painted himself as quite this wealthy guy and then you were thinking, well, why does he need to do a flat share if he's got all this money? And also, he couldn't keep up with the rent payments. No. Owed us money. There was also always an excuse. He was waiting on money from his accountant in Australia. You know, it, it was... Yeah. It just didn't stop, stop making sense. But initially, everybody liked him. Uh, yeah. and so what were the what were then the red flags because it went dark quite quickly although he never touched anybody or hurt anybody within the within the flat but no. there were red flags yeah so he 
I think I think eventually, like, you stop believing the stories. Mm. There are so many stories that you start to say, really? Is like, it just right? stops making sense. And, it, you know, he just... Your, one of your yeah. flatmates, it was, that, it was more of a gut instinct where the red flags came out. Yeah. And one of your flatmates was sleeping in the flat on her own and she went to bed with, with a knife for her own protection. Yes, yeah. Because she was fearful of him? Well, yeah, he came home drunk and broke some furniture and she was scared. Um, he was just one of those people that, you know, when they drink, it, it, the facade just goes a little bit. Yeah. You don't... You know, and you immediately think, what are you hiding? Yeah, something's not right here. Yeah. So when you heard, when you found out that this murder had taken place of this girl and that it was him, this man that was used to live with, what did you think? Shock, first of all. But then also maybe not so shocked. Yeah. You know, you're shocked it happened, but there is that little voice in your head that's saying, you know, Oh, your instinct wasn't wrong. Mm. There was something wrong here. And, you know, that we did listen to it is, I think... And that's, that's um, one of the reasons you wanted to do this documentary and be a part of it is to say, I mean, he used that rough sex in, uh, in his defence. Uh, and do you have very strong views on that? I think it's disgusting. I think, you know, she can't speak up for herself and he can say whatever he wants. You know, I... I don't think it matters what she was or wasn't into. Like, how dare he, you know, take her life? Mm. It's just, you know, and then to blame it on that, she didn't ask for that. No. You know, she can't consent to that. Absolutely and not. And, Scott, um, one of the most traumatic things I would have thought for you, I mean, it, you know, what a job you guys do, but to sit next to her parents uh, in, in court and have them have to go through that. Yeah, that, that, that's really sad. Um, you know, to feel Gillian at times sobbing and crying beside you, hearing what the defence are proposing, what evidence they're calling, the questions they're asking the witnesses. Um, yeah, it is it is sad. And as I say, you know, it re-victimises that family. And Grace can't say anything. Like Millie's just said, Grace can't give her account of what actually happened. Thank you, thank you, and continue all the good work that you do over there. Thanks for joining us today, and thank you as well. Lovely to meet you. Uh, the murder of Grace Mullane, uh, the social media murders uh, tonight, ITV2 at 9pm.